Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 9 9? Yeah, 9 Of the Psych War Podcast So I've been gone for a minute <clears throat> Had a lot of We're not even going to make excuses Had a lot of personal car troubles Kept me busy But today I'm going to start you off with a helpful fact And I'm going to call it a psych tip When you start a game of rock, paper, scissors with somebody Ask them what color their shirt is Right before you do it Because It's almost Guaranteed That they're gonna choose scissors After they do this I have tested this And it actually works I don't I don't know by what Psychological means it works But it does work But Yep Episode 9 guys It's been a It's been a long haul For this one I've been Writing down Constant things Of what I wanna say In this episode Or ways to do it But Life's been hectic as I'm sure it has for everyone as it has for as it has been for me But when it comes to trying to you know change Trying to implement change of whatever type Recently I've been reading into a lot of different books and This wasn't necessarily a book, but it was it was was a set of principles from dr. John Notter and it's called the eight steps of managing change. So when you when it comes to managing change, we we all know what we want to do. We want to we all like to set a goal and we all like to try and push and achieve and get towards that. But there's a lot of things that come in the way of that, whether that's personal life, outside interference, personal discipline, it's whatever. But according to Dr. John Notter, these are the steps that he would say are the ways to manage change. The first thing you would want to do is create a sense of urgency. Make other people aware of the need for said change. So, in this way, the example would be, you want to reform something in your local government. You want to reform something in in your household. Bring it up. Talk to people. Communicate. Now, I know that's hard for some people because they have households where people don't communicate. But... That would be the first step to it, because once you've addressed the problem and everyone knows about it, you can start getting deeper into it. The second point would be to establish teams, because this is going to allow you to have better cooperation and better communication. This is easier, you know, if it's in your household, because you're already a team. You already should be communicating properly and trying to communicate properly. But we know that's not always the ideal outlook on everyone's life. But once you establish teams, you can set a goal. You can set a kind of camaraderie and you can keep further pushing that the third thing you want to do is try to create a vision you want to establish clearly and precisely as possible what the change is going to be so that people can visualize it so if you look at a lot of like popular movies you will see it they're just when when the like when the old town not old town old time gang leader is trying to push the plan to the people he'll just grab the guy by the show you can't you see it boy can't you see the lush fields we'll be able to buy once we get this last job done? It's textbook. People have always done it. People have always going to do it. It's what they do to stir people. They try and stir the feelings in you and make you see what they see. The fourth part would be communication. You have to talk about it. You have to talk about why this change would be essential. You have to bring in others and allow them to also voice their concerns. Now, this is also a problem because a lot of people want to implement change and they just want to iron hand stern father that shit and i for one don't believe in that because all that does is make irreputable cycles that we just can't seem to get the fuck out of but as long as you do that as long as you allow people to voice their concerns and contribute to the cause and adapt it and just get, have everyone actually be a part of it and be involved or just have some role in it whether that's exercising, whether that's practicing on anything you want to be good at in life, you still have to make sure that the people you are doing it with are on the same page as you. The fifth thing would be remove removal of the obstacles that ultimately undermine the vision. Now, that can be taken in a lot of different ways. What I would assume is taken as is once you want to remove the obstacles, the obstacles will be anything that in the end is not equal it does not equate to your goal so let's say one day i want to be the world's leading i don't know 
I want to be the world's leading, what's a job that you would get disqualified for based on prior pretenses? I want to be the world's fastest runner. Now, aside from my genetics, I could train to be the world's fastest runner. But the obstacles in my way are the fact that I love fruit snacks and high fructose fucking corn syrup, and I don't like running a mile a day. Now, if I don't get past those, and those obstacles will be obstacles of myself, if I don't get past those obstacles, I cannot achieve the goal that I want in the end. I cannot implement the change that I want in the end. So, you want to remove all the obstacles so you can make your path clear and unobstructed, however long and hard it's going to be. You still want it to be clear and unobstructed. The sixth thing is you gotta you you gotta make short term wins, and like this will motivate people. Everyone likes to just be rewarded for actually putting in work. It'll see them. It'll show them that your change is working. So, if you're implementing, for me, I like to play fighting games. I like to play a lot of games in general. But fighting games really stick out to me because I can see myself one day. And I'll just get destroyed. Like, I'll just be losing to everyone. And I'm frustrated and I'm mad and I'm asking myself what's going on. And then I'll go into the training mode. I'll practice. I'll put in work. Then I'll go study frame data. I might watch a couple videos of seeing pros do what they do. And then I come back to it and I'm just mopping people. I'm way more into it. I'm way more focused. I know what's going on. I'm not getting frustrated because this guy's playing cheap. It's a short-term win over my overall goal i saw my improvement concretely when people see their improvement or they see something rewarding their improvement they like to strive for the end goal they like to strive to push themselves harder you see it work well it is bullshit when warehouses give you the bonuses of pizza but hey they give it to you that'll be your bonus oh yeah y'all y'all got all the trucks shipped out today just for that i'm gonna go ahead and reward the entire area with pizza hut they still do it because it's a form of motivation. It shows the people, yeah, we put in work and it's being rewarded. The seventh thing is do not don't don't get cocky. Don't don't do not get cocky just because you saw change. If you try and think that your change is going to be prematurely successful, it's the key to failure. You need to maintain short term goals and you have to establish that the long term goal will take time. In the end, change is not implemented over slow periods of time. It's not what humans like. We're not, if someone were to just suddenly want to just take away guns, we know it'd be civil war. If tomorrow, every fast food place suddenly upped the price of their food by $5, we'd just be like, wait, what? And then they told us, oh yeah, later on, we're going to, we're going to gradually increase our menu. People don't want that. As you up the price now. You have to make sure that you don't allow your short-term success or the short-term benefits of what you are trying to implement get in the way of your long-term goal. And this is important when it comes to savings, and I'm guilty of fucking up on that myself. So even I'm learning this stuff here. The eighth thing to do would be you have to make things more concrete. You have to understand that change is successful, and once it becomes a habit, it is universally accepted by all involved and is continually supported. So think about that. The final step to this is to make everything you're doing a habit and make it a good habit. Make it a habit that fuels you to keep going and do things and not be self-destructive and be hateful and be toxic. And make sure everyone in your group can do that. Because when you do that, it leads to the beauty that is why humans are where we are now because we are constantly and consistently working together whether we like it or not or whether some of us don't or not we do it because in 100% honesty everyone like 99.9999999999 something percent of the people that have existed on this planet are not remembered and no one ever knew who they were we can't beat ourselves up because we have to live with the anxiety of trying to beat those odds and leave our mark and I understand that everyone's trying to do that out here but we have to focus on the now and we have to focus on the change that we're trying to implement now further and on change that we want to implement when you want to talk to people and you want to try and convince them to help you 
start change or help you continue change or help you implement change. The main thing that you want to do is always give people choices. Give them what what I consider to do, which is a it's a strategy, is give people you can give people the non preferred option first and list all the negative effects. And then you wait. And then you give them the preferred option, listing the shining, listing and shining the benefits that you have of the better effects of that product or that statement. So what that would be in a sense is where do you want to go? Well, uh, we can go to Steak and Shake, but it's cheaper, but we do got to drive farther. Or, you know, we could just go to the grocery store, which is cheaper and closer, and just buy food and make it ourselves. That's You want to be able to do things like that. You you Because... Whether you like it or not, sometimes both options are going to have paths that people want to choose. And not listing them is only going to make them suspicious of you trying to obviously not give them that option. The main thing that really helps in life is sometimes you don't need to be the one that's talking, the one that's spreading information. Even if you know the information, sometimes it actually pays off to pretend to be naive. And I'm not talking about this from an evil, I'm thinking of some deep, dark plot shit. <laughs> I mean, pretend to be naive as in when someone shows you something. So to say if my friend were to say, I, I can give you an example because he's been on my show, my friend Alex. Alex, prior a week ago, we were talking about this, the thing that happened with Sony and Marvel. And I had said that Disney had basically they basically wanted more money from Sony. And what Alex had said was that that was kind of true. But it went more into the man that had been bringing Spider-Man to life. All of the different tri- trilogies. I can't quite remember his name. But he's like the father for like Spider-Man when it comes to producing. And that he had gone through a lot of hoops to try and keep let help them keep Spider-Man. And then most of the fault was to be blamed on Disney. Now, while I did understand that over the overall basis of that, Disney was trying to price gouge, not necessarily price gouge, but in the end, they were going to be making more money out of Spider-Man than Sony was. And Sony created Spider-Man. They built Spider-Man from the ground up. But Alex gave me an entirely different perspective on that. He gave me a deeper look on it that Even though I knew the end goal of it, I didn't know the things that could help support it. So I learned a new outlook. I learned a new perspective. So that's what I mean by sometimes it pays off to actually, you know, be. What's the word? Well, I just said it, didn't I? To be naive. Now, back on like negotiation strategies and biases, there's a lot of things that I learned in debate. And then I learned from just researching it myself when it comes to like trying to negotiate or bargain with people when it comes to business or business-like situations. And I'm gonna share a couple of them with you that I can seem to recall. One is like the anchoring bias. The anchoring bias is basically, the example I could give to you of this is, let's say you see a post on the internet and the guy says, I want $200 for this PlayStation 4. Price is firm. All right. He set the anchoring point on that because he said the price is firm. He threw down his anchor, and that is where the negotiation is going to start, at that. So you have to see if you can even talk him down from that. A common strategy to do during the anchoring bias, though, is list, list what you're selling for more expensive than what you're actually trying to get it for. So if I were to sell my TV, I know my TV could probably get like, I don't know, fuck, 100 bucks. It's it's an old 32 inch. I could probably get 100 bucks for it. Now, if I were to list it at 150, someone would probably offer me, trying to haggle me down, they'd probably offer me about 90 to 80, maybe 75. Now, I know 
that the most I could get for that TV is $100. And that I know how much I originally paid for that TV. So I'm still going to make my profit. And they're going to feel satisfied because they thought that they managed to negotiate after I had already set the anchoring point. That's why you want to always set the anchor. You always want to, when you go into a negotiation or business, if possible, set your number first. Because once you set your number, they have to deal and negotiate off of it. Another one, I guess you could say, everyone kind of knows this one, is the foot in the door. And it's pretty obvious. Someone asks you to do something, you know, relatively small, but it's related to what they really want or what you really want. So, you know, textbook, like calculated. <laughs> but then once they've done it and agreed to the small thing, the workup, because the way humans are kind of built is once we do something, it's easy to get us doing more stuff. Like once you've gotten up and taken out the trash, it's easier to just go ahead and sweep and go ahead and just start cleaning because you've done it. Unless you're lazy and I've been there before, but we get over that. But this is like, let's say I came up and I was like, hey, man, you want to help me move a couch? <clears throat> anyway, it's like what I'm trying to say is if like a friend were to ask you to move a couch and you move the couch and then he goes, hey, man, help me move my TV. Then you have him move the TV and then he asks you to move the refrigerator and then all of a sudden he's moving. That's what the foot in the door would kind of represent. The last one is the door in the face. And the door in the face is one that you probably experienced a lot. It's when somebody will ask you for something like super extreme and then once denied, they'll just come to you with what they really wanted. Similar to the anchoring bias in a way, but not really, I guess. But an example of this would be if somebody was like, hey man, I'm not going to be able to pay my rent. Can I borrow like $300 from you? And you're like, bro, I don't have $300. Why would you ask me for that? And then he goes, yeah, I'm sorry, man. Yeah, I understand. Uh, do you think you can loan me $20 for, for gas? Boom. That's the door in the face. And people use a large combination of these all throughout life and constantly try and hit you with them, constantly try and flip them on you. And now you know them. So when someone tries to do them to you, you're 100% ready to get against them. I don't really have much else, guys, because as per usual, whenever I'm alone, I only have about 30 minutes worth of content to speak on. Because I need discussion. <laughs> but a couple other tips I can give you is that living your life, you want to try and implement different personal habits and lessons that you yourself can reflect on. Don't reflect too hard on someone else's words because everything that applies to them won't apply to you. And you have to learn how to apply what they said and what their words meant to you. And lately I've been using this, this process called three minute rule. And it means if I can do it in less than three minutes, do it. And I feel a lot better because of it. So to say, for example, if I have to take out the trash, I'll tell myself I could get up, pick up all this trash, take it outside, put it up and be back in three minutes. It's, there's no reason not to do it. I could get the task done and complete it in three minutes and get it done. Now, whatever you want to do for your minutes, it's whatever. Other tips that I would say is in a world where people are always talking behind each other's backs, talk talk good things behind people's backs. Show them show them what you really believe and don't leave any room for them to assume. Compliment the people that you think are deserving compliments even when they're not there because it's going to get back to them. Word of what you say about people always gets back to them. So don't let it be left up to chance. Don't let it be left up to random mishap or mention. And that's all I can really leave you guys with today. I'd like to thank everyone for listening to episode number 19. 19? Oh, wait, I'm reading the wrong thing. <laughs> episode number 9 of the Psych Ward Podcast. And join me on episode number 10. Uh, things are looking up for right now in the future. Because here recently, we broke 200 plays on Anchor. Which is crazy in my opinion. But... Thanks everyone for listening.